is Philip Gunn. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Paul. I'm glad to be with you today. I thank you for getting up this early in the morning. I'm sort of glad to be with you here. <laughs> Let me tell well, you, yes, this is a perfect morning to be turkey hunting, and I have skipped oh, turkey hunting oh. to come be with you this day. Yeoman. So Yeoman. I hope you not, feel not, special. Not with just me, I'm, the entire audience from across the, the universe, <laughs> and we appreciate that. And if, we, if I hear a turkey gobble in the background, well, I may uh, leave. Just, if you hear I, one, yeah. I may go. Um, I think but, I'm the worst turkey hunter in America, though. I have hunted. Uh, I tried to catch up after the legislative session ended last week, and uh, I have yet to get one. So I'm, I'm not sure that I'm missing a whole lot by being it's one, here. It's one of those things that, that I've never done, deer and, and rabbits and things <laughs> like that, dove hunting, but I've never turned. And I, I have only one grandson, and he is him and his friends – uh, all in college, but last year went all the way to Kansas. Oh wow! To uh, to turkey hunt, and and uh, they they once you get bitten with the when the turkey bug or the duck bug, it's it's worse than deer hunting. Yes, sir. It, in it, cost too, by the way. Well, it's uh, it's a it's a great <laughs> it's a great thing to do, and I love it. So um, well, um, thank uh, you for being here. Yes, sir. I don't. I, I I do know where to start. I wanted to do an overview, but we've got plenty of time here. And uh, anybody wants to join us on uh, the ceasefire text line with a couple of questions, certainly, you can do that at six zero one eight seven nine four three nine five. I call this the exit interview for speaker. I, I I know we'll have Philip on in different venues uh, in the future for other things, but I, I got to ask you. Just looking back, when you came into office, it was a major power change in power. Uh, from the Democrats to the Republicans, and, and, and you had to have a learning curve from uh, just a member out of power in the House of Representatives to Speaker. And, I, and I, probably it was a curve as, as pronounced as the Sandy Koufax curve, but what are some of your memories when you go back and you look at that uh, on those first few months, in the first session for specifically? Well, that's uh, uh, I don't know how much history your your listeners know there, but uh, the last time the Republicans had control of the Mississippi House was 1876. So for 136 years, Democrats were in power in the Mississippi House until 2012. And mm -hmm. in 2012, we finally were able to get the majority. And at that time, it was only by three votes, Paul. So it was a very fragile coalition, obviously, when you try to pass legislation, most of the legislation is a, is a majority vote, not all of it, but um, you, you kind of had to hold all the Republicans together to get things done, and that was a real challenge. In the midst of that, the Democrats, who had been in control, were not pleased. They were not happy, and there were a number of them who set out to try to make us fail, and so there were daily attacks on the House floor, I think, uh, that that uh, were were motivated by nothing more than trying to just make us not succeed. I will say that fortunately, all of those individuals have left the legislature. We don't seem to have that anymore. Mm -hmm. But at that time, that was uh, it seems to be something I battled every day. That uh, there were efforts to just cause us to fail. Even if they agreed with the issue, they didn't want the Republicans to get credit for it. And so they sat out. So I had all that, that going on at the same time, trying to not only learn how to be speaker and learn, because I had no one to teach me. I didn't have a predecessor who would say, sat down and said, hey, let me, let me show you how to do things. Now, I will say Tim Ford was a good friend, and Tim Ford gave me some pointers, you know, from afar, but he was not at that time the speaker. So it was uh, basically on-the-job training in the midst of trying to learn how to be speaker and deal with the attacks that, 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 that came. But I had a great team, still have a great team, mm -hmm. had tremendous chairman, had tremendous uh, loyalty within the caucus, and together we were able to weather that, that challenge. Now, fast forward four years from then, <clears throat> and the um, – Republicans gained the supermajority in the next election, so we had a lot more, uh, more, more p players on our team at that yeah. point. And uh, since then, we've done nothing but gain, increase our number. And I think we're up to seventy-seven or seventy-eight. Just and, as a matter of perspective, and some of those Democrats switched over to Republicans. Yes, too, absolutely, fact, so. absolutely. Well, um, in that in that two thousand twelve election, we had sixty-four 
Republicans. 62 mm-hmm. is a majority, by the way. We have 122 House members. Half of that is 61. Therefore, 62 is a majority. So we had 64. We had a majority by three votes. And over the next three years, we had three Democrats switch, which gave us 67 moving into that 2015 election. And then as a result of that, I think we jumped to 74, 75 Republicans, which uh, 74 is the supermajority number. And yeah. today we have about 77, I think. You know, and, and there's and this is almost a, not a visceral thing, but you could feel it coming. And, and, and Democrats knew which way it was trending, too. So that three major or that three short, they, they, they might have had hopes of gaining the majority back, but they knew which way it was trending. But there was at some point, all of a sudden, it was a slam dunk because you still have, they still have the vestiges at the, at the grassroots level from the sheriffs and the board of supervisors and some of the municipalities. And all of a sudden, they, they lost that also. Even the county sheriffs went Republican. And, and it, just, it just seemed to happen within a couple of election periods. That is correct. And you're, you're, you're uh, correct to point out that the sheriffs do wield a significant amount of political mm-hmm. power. People are more concerned about crime than many other things. And so uh, I had, when I first ran back in 2003, my next door neighbor was an elderly couple at the time. They gave me money and they put a sign in their yard for me, but they went and voted in the Democratic primary (laughs) because Malcolm McMillan was running for sheriff. And they were more worried about the crime than they were about who their state representative was. And the sheriffs uh, pretty well drive the primaries. And so when you are able to get those sheriffs to begin switching around the state, and I will tell you, I've I've talked to many of them, and uh, it wasn't that they necessarily wanted to be Republican, but they just could no longer stand to be a Democrat. The Democratic Party had gone so far to the left for them and this was their own testimony. This is not me saying this. I, I would attend yeah. many of these party switching events, and I would ask the sheriff, why are you switching? I can't take what the Democratic Party stands for anymore, and they would come to the Republicans. I don't think that's changed now, because when you look at the candidates who are running in this next election, if a Joe Biden comes to town or Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg or, or a, a Gavin Newsom come to town, uh, uh, well, I happen to be fixing my truck on that day or I'm taking some kids hunting or there's there's always a good excuse yeah. for that candidate not to be there at the airport or at the speaking engagements with them so I don't think that's changed too much uh, it's probably even worse now when you go back and you look at, um, at at the at the 2023 session the highlights for you well one of the things that we made a priority on the house side was um, what to do in the wake of the Roe versus Wade being overturned. And that was done in June of last year. Yeah. And um, uh, we can talk more about that. When yeah, we let's come do back. that. Let's go to that one because that was uh, the Dobbs decision was, uh, was big. The teacher pay raise was big. The tax cuts were big. All of that. A lot to look back on in, in, uh, in the tenure as speaker. More with Speaker Philip Gunn. Coming up right after this, back with the Speaker of the House, Philip Gunn, and we were you were you were in the midst of uh, talking about uh, some of the 2023 and some of the successes there, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Paul. As we were during the break, though, I thought of one funny thing to talk mm-hmm. about when uh, you asked, uh, you know, the transition from Democrat to Republicans. <clears throat> I'll, I'll share this story. When we were in the minority, our job was to. Uh, uh, I basically stand up and ask questions about everything and, and interrogate because the Democrats were pushing policies that were not necessarily conservative or Republican. When we came into the majority, my team still had that uh, that mindset, and they kept standing up and asking questions. And, 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 and I was like, I had to call a meeting and say, whoa, time out. Realize we're now in the majority. These are your friends. They're bringing forward policies that you support. Y'all st- quit standing up and asking questions and attacking one another. So there was not only a learning curve for me, but it was a learning curve for my, my House members who had to realize, hey, we're in the majority. We've never been here before. We don't know how to act. But they finally uh, acclimated to that. You you were in the legislature how long prior to that? Eight years. Before, before so I became you, speaker, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Eight years. So you saw this, and, and, and we went through this also, because that that, uh, that that very caustic election when Billy McCoy on the last term 
what was it? You won by one vote? Yes, sir. We ended up having a, an election for temporary speaker at that time. And That's they, right. It, you yeah. know, we had three rounds of voting before he finally won. And, and he basically decapitated every Republican uh, in the in the House as far as chairmanships. Right. Uh, and, and there was not very little transparency. And I always thought that in, in speaking about this afterwards, because there were some people saying that there was not enough transparency under Philip Gunn, and I thought, where were you doing during the Billy McCoy days? So, <laughs> well, you might want to speak to that. The, the people who, who who holler about transparency want to be in the room making the decisions, and mm-hmm. they need to run for office. Is what they need to do. Um, everything we do is transparent. Everything, every decision we make goes on that board when we go into the session. You vote, and you show the world where you stand on the issues. Uh, That does not mean that every phone call that I have with my uh, chairman or that every chairman has with his members has to be broadcast for the the world. There's a lot of discussions that have to take place and and, uh, negotiations that have to take place both between House and Senate, and there is no secret a decision that is made. Everything we decide is 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 broadcast on the webcast, and it is out there for the world to see. So, do you think there, there was too much animosity between the House and Senate, both controlled by Republicans, uh, in this well, the last couple of sessions? Uh, between since between, Republicans b- have been between, in control, yes, yes. Because I, I, mean, it was, I don't it was know. One of the, it was one of the things that we highlighted here. It's hard to get together. And we don't want that much harmony. Too much harmony means bills are getting passed too easily, and we want some of that process to play itself out. But with you and the lieutenant governor coming together on several issues, it seemed that uh, you guys were further apart than Republican to Republican. Well, I I was not in leadership when the Democrats were in control of the House, so I don't know exactly what the the tension level was between House and Senate. My perception mm-hmm. was it was always pretty bad. They tell us we get along a lot better than they did before we were all in charge of, of both chambers. But I think on the whole, we get along fine. I think there are times we differ on issues, but on the whole, we get along get along well. What happened to the, the tax rebate we were all going to get? Because everybody during the off-season and summertime, we're going to get either a tax rebate or we're going to find a way to get some of that money back, and, and it never happened. Well, our position has been for a tax elimination on the House side. Mm-hmm. That is something that we have championed for about two or three years now. As you recall, Paul, we unveiled that, I'm trying to think, back in the 2021 session, I think it was, and uh, spent the entire year in 2021 traveling the state, championing the benefits of personal income tax elimination. We did that last year with the largest uh, – we didn't do the elimination, but we were able to get the largest tax cut in the history of the state, uh, which is going to probably approach $600 million by the time it's fully implemented. Mm-hmm. We came back. Uh, we still believe that is the right thing to do. We still believe we should move towards full elimination. The Senate could not – did not get in agreement with us on that. Now, the the idea of the rebate was – presented last year, but we in the House believe that the full elimination is the way to go, not a one-time rebate. And so we opposed the rebate idea in favor of full income tax elimination. I still believe that is the right way to go. I still am going to try to champion to make that happen. I think nothing that we do from a financial standpoint will benefit our citizens more than putting more money back into their pockets. And so the the House of Representatives, I will say, has been a champion for that, and we still want to try to make that happen. I, I think it passed largely because of you being on this program with the Carl Rove uh, placards and the, and the charts and everything. You, 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 you remember all those charts you put out? And I said, man... I, as a matter of fact, I don't think we have the TV like we have it now. So if we had it now like this, you could really use the charts. But I could. That's you right. came forth with all the charts and everything and, and made it simple. Well, and, we had uh, data. We had data to back it up. Was and we brought Absolutely. in experts. And the experts showed the benefits of income tax elimination. And I had mm-hmm. statistics and data to back it up. And that's what I was trying to show. How did this late entry of uh, the MAEP play into this behind the scenes? Because... We were kind of, as far as the media is concerned, didn't know that this was going to happen toward the the, the eighth inning. 
or ninth inning for some some folks, I would guess. Well, I have been very vocal in my opposition to the to MAP for many years. As you know, five or six years ago, we passed a bill out of the House to completely s- scrap MAP in favor of another better funding formula. Um, I, I think it's broken. I don't think it works. It, it um, has been funded twice in 25 years. I think that indicates uh, that the legislature just is not able to to meet what it, it, it says. It just doesn't mm-hmm. work. But if you look at how much money we put into education, and we have to distinguish here between MAEP and education, and I'm 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 many times use the word M or the, the phrase MAEP to refer to education, and that is not accurate. MAEP is just a part of what we put towards education, but the total education funding is right at what MAEP calls for. If you take the two hundred and fifty million dollar teacher pay raise we gave last year, which was outside of the MAEP formula plus the $100 million that we put there this year, that's $350 million over the last two years that we put. And that's put. not counted in MAEP. It that goes towards education, but it's yes. not going to the MAEP formula. Then we are in the ballpark for what MAEP calls for. So my point is we're funding education to the level that MAEP calls for. Yep. We're just not doing it in the formula, and the formula needs to go. What about the money from the eighty over eighty million overflow on lottery? Where does that go? It goes to education. But it does. Is that in the MAEP or in education? Uh, you know, I'd have to look at that, Paul. I, I would like I would like to say it's not in the MAEP, but I'd have to verify mm-hmm. that. What what happens as far as speaker now? Because you're still speaker, and you'll be speaker till well, either you resign or there is a new speaker elected. Correct. I will. I will still serve in that capacity through the end of this year. Yeah. Um, unless something unfolds that that uh, whatever my next career path will be that I, mm-hmm. will cause me to do that. But right now, I'm I'm still the speaker through the end of the year. I've been very privileged to serve in that role three times now. Well, that happen. But that'll happen in August, won't it? No, sir. No, sir. It won't happen. I mean, I'll serve no. till. No, I'm just saying that something else will happen. That something you're talking about may happen in August. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I don't throwing know. <laughs> I'm throwing him a word maybe, now. Maybe you know something I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, usually, when 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 some, you, I'm trying to read the body movements on this one and see the body motion on this to see exactly uh, if I had any telltale signs <laughs> on that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you uh, you looked at the budget we had this year, and the budget is uh, what seven point six yes, billion, sir. correct? Which <clears throat> is the largest. We're not talking federal funds, but the largest state budget ever. And as a Republican, you're talking about uh, decreasing the size of government and making it run more efficiently. There's a is there a juxtaposition there, or? Well, we when we took over in 2012. One of the things we we championed was that we would never spend more money than we have to spend. We mm-hmm. would always stay within our means. This is one of the things we criticized previous administrations on is that they would go out and just spend without having the dollars to back it up. We have chosen not to do that. So everything that we've spent uh, has been within our means. We have not yeah. spent more money than we have to spend. We have been very fortunate, however, that revenues have been an all-time high, and we are able to do yeah. a lot of things we haven't been able to do in the past. But we're and not spending more than we have to spend. And also fiscally conservative also as far as bonding is concerned, but we'll talk more about that. I believe K-12 through 12 is, the budget now is what, nearly $3 billion of our taxes, That's the biggest bite of all of our taxes yes, taken sir. out of our revenue for education, By $3 far. billion, By and that's not IHL. Boy, Monday, Speaker is here, and many things to talk about. I want to go to the, the hospitals and, and your thoughts on that one, because uh, we dished out some money, and we don't know how long it's going to last. I have, we, we heard maybe a week, but a matter of days, and that will be used up. So your thoughts on that? Well, speaking to the amount we had, we were talking earlier about the budget and the fact mm-hmm. that we, revenues have come in at, at significantly high levels, which is a good thing for our, our state. It enables us to do a lot of things. One of those things is to put another, I think, 103, 104 million is what we put toward the hospitals this year, which will, of course, give them um, uh, operating monies 
uh, so they can continue providing services for a period of time. Don't know how long that would last. Um, I think there are longer term solutions to that problem that that are going to have to be figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, Medicaid expansion is not the option. It's not the solution. If we had done Medicaid expansion in the past, it would still, as I understand it, not provide enough money for them to survive. So that's not <clears throat> that's not the answer. I do think hospitals are going to have to rethink the way they provide services. I have uh, certain thoughts that I have. I, I just don't know that the population base is large enough in some areas of this state to continue to support uh, a full-blown hospital level of service and I think they're going to have to move more toward emergent care type facilities. I know many of my relatives who live in a rural area when they now need anything that's non-emergent the kidney doctor, eye doctor uh, knee doctor, whatever they're going to the big cities for that they're coming to Jackson, they're going to Tupelo they're going to Memphis, they're not going to their local rural hospital anymore Mm -hmm. Uh, what they need in those rural areas is emergent care. I've had a heart attack. I'm delivering a baby. I've, I've cut my leg on a chainsaw. I've got to get help right now. And I think the hospitals are going to have to rethink the way that they they provide services in some of these areas. And I will tell you, I have had conversations with Democratic friends of mine who, who will admit and say the same thing, that hospitals are going to have to rethink, I believe, the way care is provided. I'm not an expert on what that looks like. I just know that the population base in some areas of our state has diminished so drastically that there's just not enough um, well, here's, service here's, there to, to be ha- to be pr- had. This is why this is so frustrating, too, especially in this past year, because we all know that. And I think you and I both know that one of these, not the, the cure-all, but one of the things that leads this uh, to having more services uh, from entrepreneurs or from companies who want to come in uh, adjacent to a hospital with uh, those diagnostic services, et cetera, et cetera, is to 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 eliminate cons and that and that block it. And that didn't even come up. I don't even think there was a bill that cleared anywhere to finally address a certificate of needs. There were bills introduced, Paul, and I not have, out of none made it out of committee. No, none did, made they? it out of committee. That's yeah. correct. Not, or at least I don't recall any that did. Uh, I agree with you. I I think I, I'm not. I don't understand the CON process. I think it needs to go. I have been an advocate for that for quite some time. Um, there does not seem to be enough for whatever reason it hasn't happened in the legislature but well but we know the we don't do that with, lobbyists and the money behind that we, we don't do that, that with any other arena in in that i know of other mm-hmm. than schools you know that's the only place where you have a protected area of of uh service yeah. so i think the con law uh, it needs to go in my opinion well, it, it, to me, it's one of those things that um, the, the legislators who, who have a heart of a public servant uh, and, and who are in there should care more about uh, uh, the objective and the success than their than their position. And it's right. frustrating not to even have it clear a committee with a debate on the floor of the House or Senate. Speaking of which, I know there's been a lot of talk. Just You, you hear the rumbles in the past few years about too many boards. And we've heard rumblings uh, this year, well, actually through the uh, tenure of uh, the lieutenant governor uh, in the Senate, that we have too many too many uh, committees over on the Senate side. Would you say the same thing about the House? Uh, yes, I think we have, have too many committees. I think uh, it would be wise to restructure it possibly and make subcommittees a lot more influential within the committees. I know my colleagues in other states have uh, less committees. I think we have 33 standing committees in the House. Uh, that could be restructured to be more efficient, I think. Mm-hmm. In, in the House, it's in how, is that just a rules decision? It's in the rules, yes, sir. So you, you guys could, could meet in you'd the off-season. You'd have to change the rules, right. And, and that would be changed by a majority vote? Yeah, well, there are, there are provisions in the rules for how to change the rules. You would normally do that at the beginning of a new term. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, will Philip Gunn do any endorsing as far as lieutenant governor or governor uh, races or the next speaker? Uh, you know, generally I, I stay out of those. I let, uh, uh, I let the 
uh, keep my opinions to myself. So that's a no. <laughs> when you can go, not not even not even not even in a turkey blind would he do that? Well, I support Republicans. Let's put it that way. I will I support you. the Republican, whoever the Republican candidate is. But in, within the primaries, you know, I, yeah. I, I stay out of that. You you took it was a hard time going through a couple of things. That probably the hardest was the the lottery. When you said openly, even on this program, that you were not in favor of it, but at least you let it go to a vote. Oh, you wore me down on that, Paul. You were for the lottery. I was not. You had me well, on I, here. Uh, and you I had beat been me up against about it for a long time. But you beat I, me you up about to, it, and I had to capitulate and give in. Well, if you want to, if you want to blame me, that's fine. But but <laughs> let's let's say the same thing about postpartum, though. And I mean, that was a that was a tough situation there. Well, yes, I, 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 it is a tough situation. Um, we we certainly want to provide care to mothers and babies, particularly mm-hmm. in the post row world. We talked, we started talking about that a minute ago. About some of the great things we did this year on the postpartum, I mean, on the uh, the, the the life after the Roe versus Wade. I've got about ten or twelve bills here that we passed this year to address the needs of mothers and babies. Uh, You talked about the charts that I had previously on on other issues. You know, the data uh, was very inconclusive. The data was very inconclusive on just exactly what postpartum would do. I think that's something we all struggled with, is that there was this outcry uh, for that, but yet the data, not only from Mississippi, but from other states, was just inconclusive. It did not, it it did not, confirm or show that by extending that we would receive better health outcomes but um, my position was always that I, I that's that, that, that that's what I perceived but I stood to be corrected I always said yeah. that if my Department of Medicaid would come out and provide me with data and or tell me that they were supportive of it I was open to being persuaded otherwise um, the Department of Medicaid did, in fact, send me a letter after the governor made his decision that said they did not view this as a Medicaid expansion, and they felt like uh, Mississippi could afford it. So based upon that letter, I decided to allow it to go forward. But um, that's something I had been looking for for a year. I had been asking yeah. them for a year, tell me what you all think. Tell, you know, This is my perception, but I could be wrong. You tell me what you think. And it just you- took a while for them to get me that information. Once I got that information, I said, well, this is what the Department of Medicaid wants, and we will allow it to go. I think you can say the same thing about the general public, and 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 even on the show we've asked for numbers. Just to, is there any clear, concise, yes, it is a good idea to expand Medicaid, or is it not? And and every time we get somebody on, it's it's one way or the other. There's there's a lot of gray area in there, and 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 most of the time it leans to no, it's not a good idea. Well, a lot of people will point to what's happened in other states, and I just don't know that that's relevant information because every state is different, and Mississippi is very different. We are the poorest state in the country. We have the highest population on Medicaid currently. I talked to a speaker from, I think it was Vermont, uh, no, he was from New Hampshire, who um, I see from time to time, and I asked him what his Medicaid roles were. It was 8% of his population. Well, ours is 25 or higher, and if we expanded, we would go to almost 40%. I think the numbers show that it'd be 4 in 10 Mississippians. That, that's a huge financial undertaking and burden. So those are the things we have to evaluate. We can't just say, you know, North Carolina did it. Well, their, their demographics are different. Their, their poverty level is different. And so you've got to take each state individually and decide can we afford this or not and what happens if the federal government pulls out can we afford it and that answers are a whole lot different in mississippi than they are in other states one more quick segment with the speaker of the house what's next for philip gunn we'll talk about that when we return next you will you be Will you be able to say that anymore? Has you know, the rules, voted? you're talking about the rules earlier. You're supposed to say it three times, aren't you? are supposed to say it three times. Yeah, you, you know, broke I the just rules. Can't, I can't do it three <laughs> times. It just wears me out. <laughs> so. I, I don't understand why the Senate hasn't uh, voice vote. Is that something that's in statute or something? Why can't they get know. a machine? I don't know. You'd think they'd get a machine. Jeez. They do the old-fashioned voice vote. Now, they, they try to short-circuit that by doing what they call uh, 
morning roll call. Yes. So when it, when it yes. comes to the vote, they'll do the morning roll call, which means you're for the bill unless you tell them you're not for the bill. And then it you have to laborious. stand up. The burden's on you to stand up and say, oh, I want to re record it as a no vote. And it takes real, such a long time. Real quick, this is a very short uh, segment here, but I, I want your feelings on the Capitol complex. Did that leave some open wounds, just that battle? I hope uh, with not. The, I hope not. It was a genuine, sincere effort to try to help our capital city. Our capital city uh, is struggling with crime, is struggling yeah. with uh, garbage pickup, is struggling with water. And the, 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 the Trey Lamar was the, the leader on that. Mm -hmm. um, I got to I got to tell people, you know, Trey Lamar was one of the leaders on changing the flag. Anybody who tries to act like he had some racial motivation is just flat uh, mistaken, and they're 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 casting a, a wrong image of him. Uh, you may recall my discussion on that on Thursday night before we changed the flag. He posted made a post on Facebook coming out as to why he felt like the time had come. Yep. And that yep. is the domino that fell that started the whole chain reaction over that next week that led to the change. So all this business uh, is nothing more than political leaders in Jackson trying to preserve their own political position. There's nothing more here than trying to help the capital city deal with some of the issues that they're struggling with because we want it to succeed. We want this city to succeed. It is the face of our state. It's the that's where the government uh, is of our state, and it needs to be portrayed in there, a positive light. There is a vote today, by the way, as far as another vote on the garbage deal. If not, uh, it could be up to 50 days before they, they get a contract, and it's just unbelievable. Well, so. we, we've worked so hard over the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years to, to change the image of our state. Our education has yep. improved dramatically. We changed our state flag. We... Uh, have made, I mean, our education has gone up from 50th to like number 35. We have got revenues coming in at a, at a high level. We have uh, just done the largest tax cut in history, the largest teacher pay raise in history. I mean, the list of accomplishments goes on and on. The positive news come, or the news coming out of Mississippi is positive, except for one place. And the only thing that makes national news is what's going on in Jackson, Mississippi. And we've yeah. got to change that image. Well, kudos to you, too, because uh, when you came on the air that time and mentioned that about the flag, all of a sudden the phones lit up and, and people couldn't believe it. And you had people who loved it and people who hated it. And, and uh, I mean, it wasn't the first time the flag uh, situation came up. And, and to be honest with you, prior to you, a Speaker of the House, jumping behind it, nobody thought that was a possibility at all. Well... And I mean, we I wasn't really sure it's going to happen either. <laughs> we, we were really getting tagged because I, I don't care if it was in uh, every single story was above the Mason Dixon line. If there was a shooting or a racial incident and the Confederate flag was there, it was attached to a Mississippi story one way or the other. So uh, and, and if you don't think that it matters, think about the void of those stories since we've changed it. And well, that feels good. Well, and, and the most affirming thing was that 73 or 75 percent of the people voted to embrace the new one. And that mm -hmm. that showed, I think, what the, the overall feeling of the state is on that. If a Senate seat came open, would you uh, consider that? A U.S. Senate seat? Yes. Uh, I, I would have to probably look at it, yes. So you're not you are saying that you're still open to running for another office. I am going to. I hopefully, will have many options available to me, uh, both in the private sector and the public sector. And I well, will. I mean, you have you've got an active and energetic law practice, so you are. Uh, I, I, I will evaluate the options that that come along and and try to decide what the right fit for me is. And, and and that will be made at any particular time. Yes, sir. I wish we had another hour because there were some other things. But um, well, I thought we were going to do a session recap. So I need to come back and talk about uh, what happened in this last session. How about we we give you a chance to go turkey hunting, and then we get you back in? That'd be great. Uh, that's a promise made. We'll do it. Thank you, sir. Thank so you, Paul. This, this will be Exit Interview Part 1. We'll do Exit <laughs> Interview Part right. 2 coming up. Okay. Thank great. you, Philip. Be Thank careful, you. man.